Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and welcome to another episode of Why Rockets Fail. On July 21st, 1962, the first of the Mariner spacecraft lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center on board an Atlas Agena launch vehicle. This ambitious spacecraft was intended to be the first to visit another planet, to get a close-up look at Venus, collecting new data on the environment surrounding another world. Actually, it wasn't quite as ambitious as originally planned, because the developers at JPL had a much larger spacecraft in mind, which would fly on an Atlas Centaur. But a year before the launch, the Air Force had told them that that wouldn't be available, so they had to quickly redesign and build their spacecraft to fly on board the smaller Atlas Agena, leading to a rapidly developed variant of the Ranger spacecraft. The Mariner spacecraft had a hexagonal base, about a metre across, and about one-third of a metre thick. That housed most of the electronics and the propulsion, and on top of this there would be a 3.6 metre tall uh, truss structure which contained the actual experiments. The spacecraft had a pair of solar panels for power, and a large parabolic antenna, which was required to communicate with Earth over these interplanetary distances. The whole package massed about 200 kilograms, but it would still require the entire performance of an Atlas Agena B launch vehicle to get it out of Earth's orbit and on its way to Venus. Initially, the Atlas performed well, which at this time was by no means guaranteed, but as the rocket moved further downrange, the radar and communications began to have trouble tracking the booster. Two minutes into the flight, the Atlas dropped its heavy booster engines and then would continue using its smaller, more efficient sustainer engine, but almost immediately the booster began flying erratically, making extreme corrections to its trajectory and taking it off course. Faced with a misbehaving launch vehicle, the range safety officer triggered the flight termination system and 295 seconds into the mission, it was over. The Mariner spacecraft would actually continue communicating for another minute or so before it fell into the ocean, which is kind of appropriate given its name. Immediately an investigation was initiated, and within six days, the Mariner R1 post-flight review board had determined that the cause of the failure was the result of the emission of a hyphen in computer-coded instructions, which resulted in incorrect guidance signals being sent to the booster. And by the 31st, they were communicating this to Congress. Now, if this sounds fast by today's standards, it is. But they had a good reason, because they had a hot backup. A Mariner 2 was ready to go in the event of a failure. And, then, and they had a very limited launch window in which to do it. Mariner 2 would eventually launch on August 27th. That's like six weeks later. The Mariner 1 failure has become one of those popular tropes, an anecdote to be related to people who make small mistakes that end up having huge consequences. Arthur C. Clarke wrote that the mission was wrecked by the most expensive hyphen in history. But that's really only part of the story, because it doesn't explain exactly how such a small error actually caused this huge loss. And I've never tracked down the specific report that unambiguously lays this out. The report to Congress was understandably oversimplified to make it easier to understand, and this has led to a lot of room for interpretation and misunderstanding. As a software developer, it's easy for me to see how a small typographical error in code could result in a massive malfunction. But I also wondered how a software glitch could affect the guidance system designed in the 1950s, when the computers of the time were hard enough to move around by truck, never mind putting them on top of a rocket. The Atlas onboard autopilot was in the side pod. It included gyroscopes, accelerometers, and a simple sequencer that could let it follow a pre-planned trajectory. It wasn't a general purpose computer. It was an analog control system that could take inputs from these sensors and translate those to outputs to control the rocket. It didn't run code of any sort. It was a bunch of hardwired logic that uh, would keep the rocket pointed in the correct direction. But you know, if you've got a rocket, then uh, during the ascent, there will be enough variability in the performance of the boosters, in weather, and various other features, that if you want any real accuracy in the final trajectory, you needed to have an actual computer that could run code to figure out and control this thing. And so, you had another computer sitting on the ground sending the rocket signals. 
This computer was the Burroughs Atlas Guidance Computer, no doubt the pinnacle of 1950s technology that spawned it, a room-sized device full of transistors that could run code which could launch a nuclear weapon at a target thousands of miles away, or say a space probe at a planet millions of miles away. Unfortunately, the information I can find on this is rather limited. It isn't like the Apollo guidance computer where we have documentation for everything and I can step you through lines of code. I mean, the device was used to launch ICBM, so it's understandable that there might be some secrecy surrounding it. The computer ran at a base clock rate of 210 kilohertz. It had an instruction set comprising 38 instructions. The fastest would run, uh, take about 47 microseconds to execute. The slowest would be division, which would take about a millisecond. The memory used 23-bit words with 17 of those bits being usable for instructions. Program and data memory were separate with uh, 1,536 bytes being available for uh, instructions, 256 words being available for variables, 128 words were for fixed constants, and there was also uh, panels on the front where you could set some memory locations to any value you liked. So the program and the data could be loaded from punch tape, and with the available storage, it could actually store information for two launches before it needed to be reloaded. The computer communicated with the rocket through ground-based tracking systems. So not only would the rocket send back data from its inertial guidance systems, but the ground stations would also measure the direction and velocity of the booster. All of this data would be integrated into the guidance equations and then commands would be sent back to the autopilot on the rocket. The ground system consisted of a tracking radar and a rate measuring radar. The tracking radar would determine the direction of the vehicle by locating its pulse beacon. This would also provide the uplink and downlink to the booster. The rate system would work on the velocity. It would measure a continuous wave beacon on the booster. And by measuring the frequency change, you then got the Doppler shift, which could then be converted into its radial velocity. The Atlas guidance system could actually have two rate measuring systems, which would be arranged in an L pattern to provide more data. Now, the beacon hardware on the Atlas Agena had been upgraded from the old Mod 3A, which used vacuum tubes, to a newer, lighter, transistorized Mod 3G version. But the general opinion amongst the engineers on the ground that this newer version wasn't considered to be as reliable. And in January 1962, Ranger 3 had its tracking beacon fail during the launch, which meant that the autopilot had to handle the entire launch without any input from the computer on the ground. But Ranger 3 did make it to space. Ultimately, however, it missed the moon. So now we know the hardware, let's explain the error in the software. At least how I think all this pieces together. Firstly, this wasn't a typographic error in, on the part of the programmer. The programmer was merely implementing the algorithm as specified, and the specification had, however, missed an overbar, which, as it happens, looks like a hyphen. It's a horizontal line that sits on top of a letter. In this case, the letter was R, which was supposed to measure the rate or the radial velocity. The overbar is supposed to indicate that the value being used is smoothed or filtered instead of the raw instantaneous value. So that the vibration of the rocket would be smoothed out into a nice average value instead. On Mariner 1, the rate beacon failed. And as I understand it, the rate radars were seeking this signal from the booster so they could determine the Doppler shift. Normally, they would just tune into this very strong signal and then compare that to the reference signal and the difference would be transmitted to the computer so that it could then figure out the velocity. But without this strong return signal, they would be simply tuning through their bandpass range looking for the signal. So they would either get noisy values or they would literally be returning the sweep value to the computer. And that would be integrated into the guidance computer. The overbar would have indicated the smoothing or the filtering, which would have rejected any out-of-band values, but instead the software was using the raw value, and to it, it made it look like the rocket was going crazy off course. So it commanded the booster to make radical course corrections, which were, of course, wrong. The booster was doing fine. The corrections weren't expected until after stage separation, therefore the booster flew totally fine until it dropped those booster engines and then the rocket went off course and ultimately had to be destroyed. So it was a combination of problems. 
a technical problem with the hardware exposed a flaw in the specification which had been faithfully transcribed into software. The software fix would have been a relatively easy thing to do once they had identified it, which is why they were probably quite confident in setting up a replacement launch so quickly. And even then, Mariner 2's launch didn't get off without a hitch either. Again, things went well right up to stage separation, and then one of the Vernier Attitude Control engines lost pitch and yaw control, and it kind of oscillated around in its housing until it stuck in one direction and started the booster in a roll. The booster began to spin as fast as one time per second, and they were worried that this would lead to a structural failure. But then three minutes into the launch, Suddenly the booster, the, the engine started working again and the booster stabilized in the correct attitude and continued to orbit. Now, the best explanation for this is that a connector inside the Vernier control system came off. And of course the booster, the engine was then just running around crazily. But as it began to spin up, the force of the rotation pushed the connector back into its connection and the booster regained control, continued to orbit and uh, Mariner 2 went on to encounter Venus in December of that year. And Mariner 2's data would provide some of the best measurements of the surface conditions on Venus. At this time, many people still entertain the idea that there might be Venusian life underneath those clouds. However, Mariner's data showed that this was impossible due to the scorching temperatures and pressures that had resulted from Venus's runaway greenhouse effect. So coming back to Mariner 1, the stories of the billion dollar hyphen are clearly not entirely true, but the lesson is still there. Check your code, check your spelling, and test your hardware before committing to launch. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.